Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Natural Capital Solution Series being sponsored by Better Futures Australia. Better Futures Australia would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the past, present and emerging elders of this nation and the continuation of the cultural, spiritual and educational practice of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people. Better Futures Australia is running workshops across a broad range of sectors and communities to share the great opportunities that are already happening and to scale up actions on the ground so we can raise the ambition on the climate in the lead up to the UN Climate Change Conference in, in Glasgow next year. My name is Jennifer Lauber Patterson and I'm the MD of Frontier Impact Group and also involved with Climate Crisis Capital, which Steve will tell you a little bit about shortly. In the first series of the Natural Capital webinar series, we learned the importance of creating healthy landscapes. If we are going to reverse the impact of climate change, we discuss the impact that water cycles have on climate events and how important more plants and biodiversity will have in solving our climate crisis. The importance of health of our landscape has been recognised at the Climate Change Conference, which recently in 2019, with nature-based solutions emerging as a top priority for meeting greenhouse gas targets. At the 2019 Climate Change Conference, it was recognised that one third of the solutions needed for climate change mitigation is land-based solutions, but only 3% of the funding is, is dedicated to that area. This is the second series of the Natural Capital um, webinars that is focused on harnessing the opportunities of natural capital today. The aim of this session is demonstrating the inspiring work that is already happening to demonstrate that we have the capability and it is a matter of scaling up to meet our climate change goals. If you have any um, questions um, whilst you're listening to the panel, please put your questions on, on the chat and we'll be taking questions um, after the speakers have all spoken. Um, now we do have um, um, the first speaker of today is, um, is Stephen. Um, Stephen is an international guest um, and he had to get up very early this morning. Um, I think it was a 4.30 a.m. start. So thank you very much, Stephen. He's actually founder of ARC 2030 and, and Climate Crisis Capital. The goal of ARC 2030 is to restore 500 million hectares of landscape across the world by 2030. Stephen is successfully collaborating with NGOs, businesses, universities and investors to come together to solve the climate crisis. He started his career at Arthur Anderson as a chartered accountant, but over the last 20 years, he's been working with global business families to drive private capital into impact and developing a plan to end the climate crisis. Would you please make Stephen welcome? Thank you. Thank you, everybody. It's getting slightly more civilized now. It's only six in the morning, so we're, we're, we're good to go. Jennifer, um, am I just talking or, <laughs> or is it, we're going to be no, Q&A? Stephen. All right, okay. Apologies for that. Slight hiatus. Hi, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be introduced. Um, I'm just going to give you a, a one-minute overview of the whole mission of the ARC, and then you can see where regenerative landscapes fits in. Essentially, when we started the ARC mission, it was really trying to work out what it was the world needed to do to create a winning solution um, for the climate crisis, not just scratch at the edges. Uh, we described this as, as the ARC mission is not to be a solution, but the solution. And the difference around that is of course, the thinking, the scale of thinking that's needed to create an end to global warming and a reversal of the climate crisis and the destruction of our planet. Three core pillars of that, one is to restore the 500 million hectares of ecosystems that have been destroyed by mankind since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and to roadmap that out so that it's not just words, it's not just a number, but in effect, we've created a 500 million hectare jigsaw puzzle of planet Earth, 500 pro projects, each a million hectares each, with a very clear map setting out where those ecosystems are, who owns the land, negotiate with landowners, understand what we want to do, how we want to do it, and 
essentially reset the bar. We, we need to move away from metrics that are numbers numbers of tree planted or pure carbon sequestrated. It's it's a case of looking at a holistic solution for every ecosystem. So breaking the back of how things have been done in the past and reinventing a mechanism for delivering that ecosystem restoration across five global landscapes, rainforest, forest, desert, savanna, and oceans. The second piece of the jigsaw puzzle, if we, if we restore nature-based solutions, 500 million hectares, we've also got to stop destroying planet Earth. And I spent much of the last 20 years deploying significant private capital from four and a half thousand global business families into uh, businesses that are addressing the climate crisis and the destruction of the environment. And uh, if we do those two things at scale, then in effect, we stand a significant chance of winning against the climate crisis by 2030. It is feasible, absolutely feasible and, and distinctly possible. So it's bringing hope to the journey. And if you bring hope to the journey, essentially that hope is, belongs to our children and grandchildren. So the final piece of the jigsaw is to educate a billion children around the world in 20 different languages by 2030. Um, so that when we pass the baton over to those children, we've got a, a whole world full of, of citizens who care about the planet and understand the relationship between them and what they consume, what we extract from planet Earth and, and what, we, what we take, which will hopefully be balanced by what we give. And what's interesting about all three of those things is that regenerative farming, regenerative agriculture, essentially sits on top of all of them. Uh, in certain parts of the world, there is not the economics of investment to create regenerative farming, parts of Africa and, and Asia, for example. But in effect, the people on the ground don't care about that. They just want reliable, sustainable food, resilient to climate change, resilient to drought and flood and everything else. It's not about economics. It's just about creating a different food system and food security. But that's critical. And that fits in the ARC 2030 uh, umbrella. Because in, in essence, that is about donations, but ARC 2030 is about extracting funds from companies and individuals around the world um, because they want to fund a program through their, their brand advertising and marketing budget. Uh, it's a very different sort of mechanism for funding. But essentially, regenerative agriculture in lots of economies is not about economics, it's about resilience and sustainability of food systems. Alongside that, within Climate Crisis Capital, which we're working with Jen on in Australia, Jennifer on in, in Australia, um, in effect, this is the challenge here is really interesting. The challenge here is that you have an amazing group of, of pioneers, an amazing bedrock of knowledge, wisdom, and everything else, and a story that's being told by great filmmakers around the world documentary makers and television to get it out into the public domain that actually regenerative farming is the way ahead working with nature not against it removing the crack cane of toxic chemicals that our land has got used to and, and replacing it with something that actually is meant to be nature it was after the second world war that scientists got together and said we actually don't need soil we just need some kind of granular mechanism to hold our plants and provided we feed it with chemicals and cover it with pesticides and everything else we can create food bizarre to think that 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 became a global industry in the last 70 years and, and we forgot what we used to do but actually, it's not about just really learning what we used to do. It's about applying new knowledge and everything else, which, of course, the team who's speaking today can speak with way more wisdom than I can. But I get it. I get the story. But it's not just about regenerative farming from our perspective. It's about understanding that connectivity between the individual consumer, the, the brands that are actually creating the foodstuffs, selling the foodstuffs, whether it's restaurants, supermarkets or food producers. It's about the supply chain, getting that food from the farm to those producers and into the hands of the consumer and creating the demand, the price premium and shortening the supply chain and the logistics so that ultimately the farmers get what they deserve. And we have spent 70 years post Second World War essentially replicating the colonialism of, of the last about 5,000 years, whether it was Genghis Khan or the British Empire or whatever, 
going around the world and just if we could see it, we took it. We never questioned whether or not it was ours to take. And I think the one thing that COVID is going to give us is, is a realignment to that thinking saying we now have to start considering what we take and what we give back. And that agenda for regenerative farming, I find to be one of the most exciting opportunities for planet Earth. Here's the problem, incredible knowledge and wisdom. We can resolve the supply chain and demand issues, but it comes down to finance. And when I presented the, our mission to the UN Climate Crisis Summit in New York last year, I actually started my, my speech with it's 800 brilliant people in the room. The only problem you've got is none of you got any money. And actually we need to deploy capital at scale into this industry. And that's what climate crisis capital is all about. So what does climate crisis capital actually do that's different? Well, on one side, we have to bridge the barrier between the farmers and the way they speak and the financial institutions and the way they speak, They're two totally different languages. And in essence, we're building on 30 years of working with the finance industry and private capital and institutional capital around the world say, we speak your language, we know what you're looking for, the risk management, the due diligence, the uh, economic modeling, all of those things are, can be incredibly sophisticated. But if you understand the psyche of those financial institutions and those government bodies and supranational bodies that want to deploy money in, you'll understand most of it is just being risk averse and you have to manage that risk. And if you don't speak that language, you will never get anywhere. And that's where we are at the moment. There is huge appetite to invest globally into this space. They just don't know how. And if a typical Goldman Sachs banker turned up at, at some farmer and said, hey, I want, to, I want to invest $2 billion in regenerative farming, they're going to get a gun and you know, get off my land. <laughs> they, they're just two totally different human beings. But we understand how finance works. We also understand and are committed to understanding even further how ecosystem restoration works. It's in our DNA. I've been doing this for 20 years, not the farming piece, but ecosystem restoration uh, on behalf of a number of our families. And the reality is there's an integrity about what we're doing that was missing as well from financial institutions that said, hey, we're going to go and support regenerative farming. And everybody knew, actually, they didn't really care about it. It was just a different way of spending money. You know, the zeitgeist, let's go and throw some money there. So actually, there's an integrity about who we are as a group that actually the farmers trust. And so how do you bring those two things together? The one thing that the financial institutions and private capital is after is scale. That's really interesting. They don't want to go around and do one farm here, one farm here, one farm here, because every single farm that needs money requires a risk measurement, a risk process. And that is very time consuming. And so the returns that are already quite marginal from the financial investors perspective get crushed to a point where it becomes impossible. So we needed to create scale. So what we have done is go around the world and pull everybody who's anybody together in this industry, different opinions about what to do and how to do it. That's fine. The analogy we use, it's like a peloton for re regenerative farming. Uh, uh, it's like a peloton for regenerative farming, different teams, different ideas, different strategies, but together the collective peloton becomes an incredibly powerful force. And by creating that peloton of regenerative farming with partners around the world who are under this umbrella, you create investability at scale. That's what climate crisis capital is doing, bringing climate crisis capital in, onto the table and then working with the best people around the world to help make it happen. Um, I think it's an incredibly powerful um, model. Uh, we, we decided, although I'm sitting here in the United Kingdom at six in the morning, um, uh, for a number of reasons, I selected Australia as the as the point where I wanted to start this program globally. I think because some of the greatest minds in regenerative farming uh, are, are in Australia, and um, and we've got access to knowledge and expertise that understands how to finance the transition into regenerative farming from these uh, from these farmers who are ready, willing, and able to convert. They just need the arms wrapped around them to say, we will guide you through this process. And it's not just about putting money on the table. It's not just about knowledge. It's not just about giving them resources. It's about looking after the entire holistic framework that they need to, to allow them to take that step. If 
farmers are incredibly pragmatic people, as I'm sure you know. Ultimately, this just comes down to, are we going to be fed? Am I going to be able to feed my family? Am I going to pay my staff? Am I going to be existing next year? Yes, all of those things, but they need that reassurance that we're going to be there every step of their way with the knowledge, with the education, with the wisdom, with the resources, with the money, and take them through a transition so that they become farmers that are giving to the consumers what the consumers want, which is a connection with food and where it comes from. COVID has been a, a global economic shock for all of us, but actually it has allowed the vast majority of the world to think about resetting how we do things. And whether we're in the Western world, the first world economy, where we just are get, getting a sense of the only things that have mattered over the last nine months, power, internet connectivity, food, toilet paper. <laughs> so the basics of life are, are all in place. And, and that reality of thinking, the one thing we cannot live without is food, should allow us to rethink how we value the people who produce that food. The desire for consumer goods and everything else just went down, but the desire for food, of course, remained static, of course. So we need to reevaluate that relationship. And that's what this is about. It's about getting that back onto the agenda at scale around the world. It will happen. It can happen. And we're connecting those two uh, industries. So successful and bright future ahead. Very exciting. Jennifer, any questions? Yeah, th thank you. Um, just unmuting myself. Um, you're very inspirational, Steve, and, and the vision, I think, is really important. And unless we collaborate, we're not going to get there. And that's what I like. The vision that you have is something that, that will achieve um, a solution to the climate crisis, and we want to be a part of that. But what do you think about Australia's contribution? You're, you're talking about 500 million hectares globally. What is the aspiration that Australia should have and is possible, Stephen? Well, I I think part of the reason that I chose Australia, and this was before the fires actually, uh, was uh, A, as a child, I was brought up watching Jacques Cousteau and the Great Barrier Reef. So that's always been one of my great ambitions to help restore, protect and restore the Great Barrier Reef. And the second was a, a trip to WA where I flew the entire length of WA with one of our family members. Um, and I was just looking out at this great big landscape and the redness and the, the dust and everything else, thinking, wow, this could be almost like the Amazon of, of, you know, of, of the, the other half of the world. It, it's, as, it's an amazing landscape, the enormity of it. Of course, I was aware of it, but it's only when I flew over it did I really see how spectacular it was. And I looked at this and thought, you know, if we're to restore 500 million hectares, Australia in real terms, globally, Australia has got, got to deliver something like 80 million hectares of ecosystem regeneration. And when, you, when I looked at the big ecosystems in Australia, it was the Great Barrier Reef, it was the forest areas destroyed by the fires, and then this kind of wheat belt where everything I was hearing about the drought and the difficult situation that most farmers were in. Uh, and I just thought, this is perfect territory for uh, an economy that, that could be um, you know, totally re pioneering the rethinking of how farming is actually done and there's nowhere else in the world that compares with it i mean you know i talked to farmers in europe and and uh, america and, and places about the scale of of some of the farms in australia and you know they talk about their great big farms and they're like you know ten thousand hectares or something and i'm saying that you know some of the conversations in australia that that's kind of like the backyard where the kids play <laughs> the rest of the farm is farming so i think it was the opportunity of scale and the wisdom that's already in Australia that makes it, for me, the most exciting continent on earth for regenerative farming. I think the diversity of, of environment, um, the diversity of conditions, everything about it is almost the panacea for this great big experiment to say, what, what is possible? And we have to think about what is possible, not just, you know, what can we do? What can we get away with? We've got to dream the unimaginable. And some of the programs we're looking at, we haven't even begun to speak with people about what they are because they're so crazy. They're so back crazy about the scale of the ambition. But it has to be. 500 million hectares is a lot. Australia's got to deliver 80 million hectares. 
and, and that's an enormous amount of, of land and farming will be a huge part of that. So I think it, could, it, it, it it's inspiring. The knowledge is there, the wisdom is there. You've got some amazing people so I'm speaking today as well, of course. Um, everything about it is the perfect lead player. And, and actually when politically Australia has historically, certainly in recent history, been on the back foot in terms of the environmental record. I think this is one place Australia can actually step up and say, we're going to lead, we're going to lead, lead the way globally. Wonderful, Stephen. Thank you for that. And what is exciting um, with the next lot of speakers is they're already providing the solution. So what we're going to show now is the case study to show that um, our, that ambition for Australia is actually possible and, and it could even be better than that, Steve. And I think we should aspire for more. And what I'd like to do initially is introduce you to Clyde, who's from Cassinia Environmental. He's also an Indigenous elder. Um, Cassinia is a, a, um, one of the many beautiful co co um, companies out there that um, it's one of the best kept secrets, I, I think. Um, they've actually been around for 20 years and not many people um, have heard of them because they've just been on the ground getting the job done. But how great is that? We've got, we've got a group with 20 years of experience investing in biodiversity projects. They've developed 50 properties over 40 different types of landscape. That um, is extraordinary. And what Clyde will also share with you, he's, he looks after the Indigenous partnerships and they're a group that has integrated um, Indigenous learning into the way that they do things. And the other thing I love about what they're doing is they've already protected 40 threatened species. This is a company that everybody should know about um, and is a company that can very much scale up because they've already developed the business model and, um, and Cassinia have said to me, they aim to get um, 1 million hectares restored. So we've got 1 million hectares, Stephen, of what we need to um, achieve already um, 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 confirmed. We've just got a few more to go. Um, Tony might be at, at a few more million hectares when we speak to him, but um, I think it's really exciting. Um, so I'd like to now pass you over to Clyde um, um, to actually um, to provide um, um, an acknowledgement to country, but also to provide a little bit of information about his work at Cassinia. Over to you, Clyde. Are you there, Clyde? Can you hear me? Hello, Clyde? We can't get the sound on. Clyde, do you have um, mute on? You do. Can you take yourself off mute? What we'll do. Jen, you're on uh, mute, Jen. Thank you for letting me know. Um, so um, what we'll do, we'll um, move across to Tony, who chairs the Australian Holistic Management Cooperative, and he's also um, jointly founded Land for Market Australia. Um, he's a real leader in the space, um, and he's um, designed the implementation of the Ecological Outcome Verification in Australia, um, which has been accredited by the Savory um, Institute. He's an incredible um, person, um, just puts so much time and passion into what he does. And with the ecological framework, he looks at how can you maximize the benefit for the farmer as long as, as, as well as um, the land and um, agricultural production. I'd like to now pass you over to Tony. Thanks a lot, Jennifer. I hope that you can hear me okay. And, uh, and it's great to have this opportunity to talk to everybody. Um, the evidence is out there, isn't it? You know, we've broken things. We've broken these ecosystems on the planet. 
And, and the question in my mind over the last, you know, 40 or 50 years has been, how much damage does it take before the ecosystems actually fall over? And I think we're starting to see that, the evidence of that now with the megafires and the droughts, and even the COVID story um, is related to all this. So the question is, how do we make this better? How do we work out where we're going? And I think the common um, idea in the community is that in order to heal land, we need to take agricultural production off that land. And that's the implementation of national parks in Australia. We take the production off, we set up the land and we, we kind of do a hands-off sort of management approach to it. Um, that's quite different to our Indigenous heritage where Indigenous management across the nation over millennia uh, was a very much a hands-on detailed approach to management of the land. And the question is now in our own circumstances and with our cultural and historical background, how do we move to a situation where the land can improve and we can maintain the all important agricultural production? In fact, it may be possible that agricultural production and the use of animals is actually a key tool to heal the land. So that's, that's a critical uh, thought and something that is, is in a way breaking the mental conception. What we've been able to do uh, with ecological outcome verification is for the first time monitor and verify the ecological health of farmland that is still under production. Uh, nobody before has attempted that and it's a breakthrough techno technique that has been developed and uh, made available through the Savory Institute uh, uh, under Alan Savory's guidance. So that's been our effort in Australia is to bring this uh, this approach, this protocol, and demonstrate that it is practical to do it. Uh, we've got more than 40 baseline sites across the country, and we've been doing that in a way that now, uh, after two or three cycles of monitoring, we're starting to see which farms are actually improving their ecological health and which farms are struggling uh, and to make that work. The incredible news out of these reports, and we haven't done any kind of formal aggregation of this, but just because I've been looking over the individual reports, what I've seen is circumstances where the, the climatic and weather conditions have been very demanding for farmers. You know, at times I've seen things as bad as, you know, rainfall down to 50% of the normal rainfall in an area, and yet, those farms, some particular farms have been able to maintain their production and maintain the ecological health of their land despite those extremely demanding circumstances. And that obviously raises the question, how and why? What are those farmers doing? How are they able to manage uh, that? But the first step in this process is to actually get the robust measurement. And we do that through ecological outcome verification. It has three components to it. Uh, we do a visual assessment of indicators that tells us about the health of the ecosystem processes on that farm. We do a detailed analysis of the pasture species that are involved. And finally, we do some measurements of soil health. So three components, and we do those on an annual basis with a more intensive investigation every five years. So people might ask, well, what's that got to do with the climate? And, and a lot of people are focused these days on that crucial indicator of carbon and carbon dioxide in particular in the atmosphere uh, or any of the other greenhouse gases. And the, the key point is that a healthy planet uh, uses that carbon in the atmosphere, uh, uses it through the process of photosynthesis to grow plants. And we know that plants are the basis of all food uh, for so much, so many life forms, including ourselves. So whether we're choosing to eat meat or whether we're just choosing to eat, eat vegetable matter, uh, it doesn't matter, plants are still the basis of that. And if we give up on plants, uh, we, we really give up on the health of the planet. We need to be part of that system. And authors like Charles Massey have demonstrated to us that we need to stop thinking of ourselves as separate from nature, but see ourselves as part of nature. So, so carbon is critical to all those processes, but just taking carbon by itself doesn't really solve the problem because 
if you just think of carbon alone, um, you haven't addressed the crucial questions of how the ecosystems are working and how biodiversity links everything to everything else so it's all stable. And so you're at severe risk of disrupting those ecosystem processes. So, so once you get your biodiversity working properly across agricultural land, potentially through a regenerative agriculture approach, you have the capacity to draw down and store or use um, huge amounts of carbon. So many people focused on the emissions side of the equation and fossil fuels and a very interesting side of the debate. But if we just ignore the drawdown and the capacity of regenerative agriculture inland to draw down and store more carbon, uh, we're missing a major part of the picture. So, so that's why we're focused on biodiversity. We'd love to do a bit more measurement in the carbon space and I'll talk about the need for investment in a minute, but let me just add to the story. So we've got a robust measurement for the first time with ecological outcome verification. We can go out and monitor, the, monitor and verify the ecological health of farmland. Using that as our foundation, we can then inject that information, that robust measurement out into the community so that businesses and consumers can choose to spend their money in a way that helps the ecological health of the planet uh, rather than taking us background, backwards. And so for the first time, Land to Market Australia, the brand, gives consumers the opportunity to make those decisions. Already we've got five market partners associated with Land to Market Australia and more coming on board and some pretty big announcements about how people can access and make those choices about spending their food. So there's plenty of action in that area, plenty of commitment from our businesses. We've done the proof of principle. We've demonstrated that this can work, that it is a practical exercise for farmers, that we can do robust measurement, and then we can link that, that to the brand. So already we've made those achievements. How do we take this further? How do we address those big questions? We know that farmers are managing at least 50% of the Australian land mass, or maybe even more, maybe up to 60%. How do we make this available at the scale that they need to do that work? We need investment to help us with that process. We need investment for the farmers to improve their agricultural situation and move forward. Up until this point, all the work that we've done has been supported by farmer fees. And we know that farmers are under a huge amount of pressure in all sorts of directions. They're under price pressure from the, the food supply systems. Uh, they're under all sorts of pressures, but we've had enough farmers commit ourselves to this process uh, so that we can demonstrate that it works. But we need to make, take the step to the next level. Amazingly, well, I'll go back. I'll say that uh, the surprising thing is, well, we know that the wheels of government move slowly in some circumstances. And so we've chosen to go down the route of direct action by farmers to make this work without having the imprimatur of government. And even though we've had some discussions with government and there've been some kind of potentially opening doors for a while, we haven't seen sufficient action from government yet to get join these parties. So we're still relying on the farmers coming up um, with the funds to make all this work at the moment. And that constrains us because we know that farmers' budgets are very tight and they don't have the finances to make this work. So the investment side of the story is now particularly important. There are a few uh, slightly opening doors coming with, with government. And one thing that I'm, I'm really hoping to do is to progress a project um, under the federal government's call for a drought resilience innovation hub. Um, if we can organise a regenerative agriculture approach to drought in Australia, it would revolutionise our situation. We know that current drought policy is totally dysfunctional. It's sending all the wrong messages to farmers at the wrong time, despite the fact that we want to help them out when things get difficult. If we can renovate that drought policy, we can do so much to help Australia's future. Uh, so we certainly are looking for investment into that process. What we'll do is build a tool that farmers can use uh, encapsulating key approaches such as holistic management uh, and landscape hydration. Um, 
and then we'll build that into a landscape scale package where we can rehydrate our catchments as well. Uh, so the deadline for that is 23 December. We hope that the government is genuine in its call. We want to engage with Indigenous input so we can uh, build on the traditional knowledge of Australia and the understanding of the way that the Australian environment works. We can join all those dots and build a new drought package uh, for Australia. So that's our immediate challenge, is to get that to happen so that then our ecological outcome verification, our land to market initiatives become absolutely focused on this crucial issue for Australia. Thanks a lot, Jennifer. Oh, that's extraordinary. And that framework is what is going to be a real game changer as well, Tony. Um, how do we get the commute consumers to understand the brand and, and how quickly can we get them to come on board? It's only going to be at the moment through the businesses joining forces with us. The businesses already have access to that, organize, that, that audience and mm -hmm. they have communication with their consumers. We know that the consumers are crying out for straightforward actions that they can take to help these problems. You know, when you sit there at your lounge room and you're wondering, you know, what are the things that I can do about these huge global problems? Just the simple action of changing your spending patterns on things that you have to buy anyway is a very mm -hmm. simple action. And if you do it based on this information and this guidance, you know that you're making a difference. Mm. And how many hectares are possible? You knew I was going to ask you that question, didn't you? Well, you know, the question is whether we've done this at a pilot phase or whether we're really out there in the action. Mm -hmm. At the moment, we're on about 50,000 hectares of land that's been monitored through our process. And I mm -hmm. reckon that's a pretty good trial, a pretty good demonstration that we can do it on a much bigger scale. But we need all the skills to make that, that happen. And so we need investment into the tools investment into the farmers and investment into the skill base to make it grow uh, to a meaningful contribution and we can make a real difference to to carbon and the health of our biodiversity. Absolutely I do love your framework and um, I've been looking at valuing how to value natural capital and your framework is a really big part of that because it's so practical and it's a lot of common sense um, and it's something that I think works really well Tony so well done for the work that you've done on that. What I'd like Thank to do so now much. is introduce Clyde, because Clyde is here, everyone. So we're really looking forward to hearing from you. We've already introduced you, Clyde. So if you can be taken off mute, um, I'd love you to um, do the welcome to country and, um, and also talk a little bit about Cassinia and yourself. So over to you, Clyde. G'day, can you hear me? Can yes. you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, I'm not quite sure where you're um, where you're from. Uh, are you in Victoria? Um, we're all over Australia. So, um, would you like to do a welcome from wherever you you are, Clyde? That would be wonderful. For some reason, your volume is down. I can't really hear you very well. Um, if you just do a uh, welcome from where you are, that, that will be fine because we're all over Australia. Okay. Well, I'll do it in language. Yinti Nankri, Namawi Michi Clyde, Ngapi Nguli Andu, Tarui, Ngarinjiri, Ngana, Banjalang, Gunjiramara. Uh, um, so I just welcomed you to a few different areas uh, in the country in my language. So, so uh, welcome all. Land is very important in our conversation. And so when I said, Really, I think we're having a few problems with um, the internet over there, guys, which is why we did have trouble getting Clyde on earlier. So I do apologise for that. 
But the great news is um, hopefully Clyde will be able to come back on because um, I think it would have been beautiful for him to share that message. And I think he will get back on, fingers crossed. But what I'd like to do now is introduce you to um, a, a special video um, around Peter Andrews' work. And Peter Andrews has pre-recorded pre a message for Better Future, the Better Future session. I think Peter is actually a genius and his work actually complements what um, Tony's um, group is doing in a, in a very beautiful way. Um, Peter Andrews actually started his life as a horse breeder and that's how he gained the knowledge of how the natural landscape worked and how he learnt the methods and learnt from the history of the land on what needed to, to be done. And what he's done is extraordinary. And um, the other Peter, Dowson, will, will be covering um, um, an example of some of the work that he's done. Peter, um, Peter um, Andrews has got an Order of Australia for his work. Um, he's been he's um, authored books, Back from the Brink. If you haven't read it, I couldn't put it down once I was reading it. And he's been featured on Australian Story three times. So, so pretty incredible. I remember reading um, the book Back from the Brink and Jerry Harvey, who most of you would know from Jerry Harvey, Harvey he's a real advocate for um, Peter and probably because um, through the work that Peter's done, he's got some of the best resources in Australia. So, um, so he's very pleased with the work that Peter does. But he stated in the book, while Peter is, a, is as resilient as the landscape scape he works in, it's time we share the effort to reverse the degradation that is occurring across Australia by examining the natural interventions as a mainstream option for managing much of our country. So maybe going back to the natural ways of things, which is what Tony was also talking about and what Peter is talking about, and all of these case studies that show it's all possible. So I'd like to now pass you over to an amazing filmmaker, Peter Dowson, passionate um, in this space, wonderful to work with. Over to you, Peter. Hello, welcome to the Better Futures Initiative. To get climate recovery, it's necessary the landscape functions in a particular way. When we look at the ancient Australian landscape, and I refer to it as a blueprint, it was managed by plants. They compensated for the failures of other environmental systems like lakes, snow-fed rivers, and so on. So it was my intention to show that we can manage 60% of the water we're currently draining away and losing in evaporation and by reversing that the automatic system just reappears. So if you have a better future or need a better future or hope for a better future you must grow plants and everyone who grows a plant is contributing to that future. That's absolutely beautiful. Now, Peter, over to you. Peter Dowson, um, the film producer. Thank you, uh, Jennifer, and just acknowledging I'm on Gadigal land here in Sydney. And I'm a filmmaker and storyteller, and my journey with Peter Andrews began, well, before that I was studying permaculture, regenerative agriculture, holistic, um, all of these different methodologies for a long, long time uh, with friendly farms, uh, not for profit. And we go out there and meet these pioneers and our aim is to promote the work of the pioneers and help get that into the mainstream. And somewhere along the way, I realized that we were missing a big piece of the puzzle uh, when it came to regenerative. Um, and I found myself in Bialong, in the middle of the battle for Bialong, stopping a coal mine in its tracks in uh, at Town Park and that's where I met Peter Andrews and I realized I was actually stepping into a much bigger story than what I even had realized was there and that was the story of the landscape and the story of ecosystem restoration and creating the conditions for regenerative agriculture to flourish um, so before we we can farm or do anything on the top of things getting the hydrology getting the water uh, reinstating the water cycle and getting the plants going again so that um, and 
what I learned from Peter and, and through years of um, following Peter and I've tried to articulate some of the work and we'll see a film in a moment that'll speak better than what I can articulate in, because Peter can speak for himself. It's um, what I've learned is that nature is our greatest teacher and um, the landscape that we're in is nature's laboratory and that's a place for us to study and learn um, and to move forward in this really exciting decade on ecosystem restoration that the United Nations has declared 2021 to 2030. Um, it's good to go back to first principles and, and learn and understand how does nature automatically evolve a flourishing ecosystem, exactly what it did here for millions and millions of years, back to Gondwana land in this country. And we can study, we can go out into the landscape and we can see that. And that's what Peter refers to as the blueprint uh, for ecosystem restoration. And uh, that it's, it's something that I'm really excited about is this landscape literacy that we can um, learn more about and that will put us in the right track going forward into the, into the decade, going to COP26 and all of these things where we can start putting, going back to first principles, getting the landscape right and moving forward. So I just wanted to present the film and um, uh, my appreciation for Peter Andrews in sharing so much with us over the years. Thank you. Well, the Whedon Brook contains a property, Barrimal Stud, it's called, and it's been the home of some of the world's best thoroughbreds for 150 years. And I said to Jerry, when I started here 15 years ago, I'll build you a world's best property. And I've put a lot of effort into doing this. And of course, we've had a drought, then a major fire, and then a flood. And this area conducted itself in a way that the ancient landscape had previously done. And now we're watching the plants take over. And once they do that, we really can just coast with the management because the plants do 90% of the work. So I have a lot of trouble when I'm asked, where is the economics of this? And we never mention the simplest thing. Everything that's life-giving is a result of plants packaging sunlight. My name is Peter Andrews. I've spent a lifetime recognising that this was a unique landscape. And when I first started in this endeavour, I was at Bylong, which was a sister property to this, just 20 k's over the valley. And there was the best equine athletes in Australia, and in fact, probably on the planet. The specific things that are able to be seen here, the Wollongby Pines, not that far distant from here, and when you've got sandstone cliffs for 30 and 40 miles, not just kilometres, the water roars out of them. You've got a huge catchment with very little moderation of the flow. And certainly the quality of fertility has the very worst potential because it can't come out of sandstone rocks. They don't produce fertility. So my belief was, surely, if we could repair these catchments under the worst conditions, so could the rest of the world. The miracle of it all is, which is so visible, so easy for somebody to walk about here and me show them the good and the bad and the ugly as I could do in every else in the country. And from a world perspective, it doesn't matter whether we're in Namibia or the top of the Colorado or wherever. There's a connection people understand. We're sitting pretty close to where the cliffs come out onto the floodplain, which they've developed from here down. We're looking at this particular structure, which was put in about 12 years ago. It's a contour that stretched from one side of the valley to the other. And in fact, this was filled up with sediments as our valleys previously did. And then the plants managed the sediment, living compounds and all of the fertility. And, you know, you would think the Murray River and the Darling River were slightly different to this little stream, but they're not. The principles that run them are the same. This whole continent is the flattest, the largest, has the least number of climate backups, yet it still evolved the singing birds, the flowering plants, and two thirds of the fish species, and the most balanced climate on the planet under the worst conditions. That's where we should start. How does it do that? How does the climate work? How does it maintain water management in the landscape? How does an unlimited flood work without damaging things? 
But even after that, the relationships between what this plant does and that plant and this plant and all the other things, there's 50 different opinions and most of them don't follow the rules that I can see in this landscape. There are scientific terms that relate to the way this landscape works which are fully relevant. One is field capacity. If you can have water sitting up there where the water's going into the soil and a whole new range of plants can live where it's coming out, it's the highest level of productivity. The plants can draw up the water they need, photosynthesize, everything comes into balance and it could be shown to support every form of agriculture, including the most healthy individuals, such as the fastest and the best horses. It should be significant to anybody else if they wanted to understand how it works. In my lifetime, I've watched systems recover from desertification, and then I've watched it recover from total saturation, and that is not in the science today. It's only because of this old landscape that I've been able to understand it enough to see it, and then to teach people how to use it. And that in fact, it's possible for every person growing a plant to contribute to the result that this landscape had automatically achieved. Absolutely beautiful, Peter. And do you know what amazes me? Um, like there are some practices that can take um, a long time because sometimes um, it does take time um, for nature to do its thing, but it can also be very quick. And, you know, from what I've seen is within 12 months and within one rain event, you can get a really big impact um, with these practices. Absolutely. And I think Peter Andrews would be the person to speak best to that if he can. Um... Okay. Can we put um, Peter Andrews on? Good evening, people. Hello, Peter. Hi. Well, I don't know. Um, it's a simple but complex description. And of course, if all of the things that we've pointed out, and I mean, I was amazed that it stored water in the most effective way in our floodplains, which we've nearly all destroyed. And I found that you could put it back without too much effort. And then we have to understand that plants, when they're growing fast, use a lot of water. So that's part of the climate issue. It's not plants that don't grow very fast at all. It's the plants that actually grow quite quickly and doing the job we need. And science seems to have lost this. We think we're in a dry country and we should be just having plants that don't use much water, well, that's just going to make it worse and worse and worse. But there is plenty of science today. And I suggest that if we fix it from the Grey River down to Geraldton on the West Coast, and we rebuilt that vegetation there, it would contribute to a major shift in Australia's climate. So, I mean, you can go on about it forever, but I prefer to take people and show them these things rather than try to explain it because there are so many things in the visual evidence that words don't transfer very well. So I'm always of the opinion, whatever is attributed to what I'm talking about, I'll take you and show you an example of how it functions and how you can best use it. Thank you. Peter, um, just specifically on that in terms of the West Coast, um, because we have degraded the land, what implications occur in the on, on this side of the country? Can you just go into that a little bit further? Because I don't think um, 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 a lot of people appreciate that particular um, well, I've been working for uh, 25 years with a group of scientists who have virtually been tearing their hair out because from 50 years back, they discovered how this plant-based landscape, and of course, we, we read the uh, Columbus reports of uh, islands shrouded in mist and plants that wouldn't burn because they were too damp. 
It means that the sea, if it's the land is not kept cool in the sea by this water vapour and evaporation, then it will rain more often on the sea. It's pretty basic stuff. Well, this group have done all of the work required to understand this. And that in fact, <coughs> by getting this vigorously growing plants on that side of the continent, they will put a big bubble of water vapour in the atmosphere. And that means that that area would be much cooler than the sea. And so that bubble, which obviously extends out over the sea as well, when the sun went down, it would start to shrink back onto the trees and that would pull the water off the sea. And of course that then, after it builds a bit more, contributes to our rain. I mean, that's really simple, but it's very well described. It's scientifically absolutely certain. And the, the skeleton of this landscape, if because we can measure back so accurately today, whereas we're not really that sure what might happen tomorrow. So this is not speculative. This is real stuff. And it's really true. And I've never had a problem with the best scientists I could find denying any of these things being absolutely on the money. Yeah, um, and that's so true, Peter. I've um, validated a lot of that from a number of scientists and um, going back to how nature did things can rehydrate um, our land and it can do it in a cost-effective way and an efficient way. And coupled with what Tony's doing and coupled with what Clive offers um, in the Indigenous um, um, area, um, I think we've got the whole package here um, but we do have a final speaker, um, and so we'll, we'll I'll just introduce Alyssa um, for the for the last session. Alyssa, I've known for quite a, for a very long time, actually. Alyssa, um, I'd hate to think how long. Alyssa is a lawyer. Um, she's a partner at Norton Rose, focusing on climate, um, and she's always worked in the environmental space. She's also the chair of the Climate Market Institute. Um, how she fits in is I believe that carbon markets can provide a value add. When it comes to soil carbon, they shouldn't be the main driver. And I think a lot, this is just my view and it'll be interesting to get views after. But um, they're things that you um, should be doing, but the carbon credits play a role of inspiring farmers to get on board because there's additional economic value. And that's the value add. And carbon markets can be very complex though to navigate. And um, what we're hoping in is that Alyssa, Alyssa can give us a bit of an overview on the carbon side um, and provide us with what some of those opportunities um, are. So over to you, Alyssa, thank you. Thanks, Jen. Um, and as Jen said, really what I wanna to do tonight is give you a bit of a understanding um, of the role of carbon markets, a bit of a where have we come from and, and where are we currently and then what does that opportunity look like going forward. Um, so carbon markets have been around for probably around 20 years now. Um, they first really kind of um, developed under the Kyoto Protocol and many of you might have heard of the Clean Development Mechanism which was a mechanism um, put in place under that protocol which allowed projects in uh, developing countries to be undertaken to um, reduce emissions or sequester carbon and then to allow credits to be generated from that activity and sold into um, countries that were looking to reduce their emissions in line with um, the targets that they'd set under the Kyoto Protocol. Um, what's happened since those early days is we've had carbon schemes emerge across a number of dur different jurisdictions. Um, and there's probably a key distinction, I guess, that needs to be made, which is um, where there is a compliance obligation for a company or a country to reduce emissions and where they can't reduce emissions to then use carbon offsets or crediting is their way of dealing with that compliance obligation. But there is also the voluntary sector. And, you know, the best example of the voluntary sector is being able to choose to offset your emissions when you go on a flight. Um, and um, I think what we're seeing at the moment in terms of carbon market activity is very much um, 
uh, not a huge amount, and this is in an Australian context, not a huge amount of activity in the compliance sector, but lots of activity and emerging opportunities and growth in the voluntary sector. Um, the other point just to make about the compliance sector is ultimately what we're hoping to achieve under the Paris Agreement is a fully global carbon market. Um, so there is what is known as Article 6, which is um, a section of the Paris Agreement, which essentially sets out how it is intended that carbon markets will operate and will be able to be used by countries to meet their nationally determined contributions, which are essentially their targets that they've committed to under the Paris Agreement. So it is intended that there will be that kind of market infrastructure put in place, but that will then interlink to some extent with the existing schemes um, that are currently in operation. Now, um, what I thought I'd do, first of all, is just give you a bit of an introduction to the Australian scheme, and then um, kind of give you an idea of where that scheme's at at the moment, um, that kind of the activity levels that we've seen under that scheme, but also look forward to um, how the scheme might evolve um, as we move forward. So um, I've got a bit of law here now, as I would, given I'm a lawyer, but um, the scheme itself was established under um, legislation back in 2011. Uh, the piece of legislation is the Carbon Credits Carbon Farming Initiative Act. So it was actually put in place originally by the Labor government, um, but um, is something that has managed to continue notwithstanding um, coalition government coming in back in 2014. Now, when the CFI, um, there are lots of acronyms in this area, so excuse me, but when this carbon farming initiative, the CFI was introduced in 2011, it was intended to be just a land-based scheme where projects could be undertaken on the land to generate carbon credits, which could then be sold to companies that had a compliance obligation under the carbon pricing mechanism. So you may recall that was um, a mechanism introduced by the previous Labor government in 2012 um, and then repealed by the Abbott government in 2014. So we did have a window there where the CFI operated uh, in conjunction with a compliance um, obligation on large emitters to um, use the credits coming out of the scheme. So what happened is when the carbon pricing mechanism was repealed, we then moved to a new scheme called the Emissions Reduction Fund. And essentially, this was a fund put up by the coalition government of 2.55 billion, um, which was designed to purchase the credits coming out of our carbon farming initiative scheme. There was another quite critical change made to the scheme at that time, which was to say, well, we're going to open up um, the scheme to not just projects on the land, land-based projects, but also to allow projects across all parts of the economy um, to participate. So for example, energy efficiency projects or other projects which um, operate in resources sectors or um, industrial sectors where you can reduce emissions by, by taking action. Um, so an expanded remit for the scheme. Um, and so that emissions reduction fund has been operating since 2014. I'm going to show you some stats in a minute as to how it's performed. Um, we now have um, that scheme has essentially been rebadged. So we've now got yet another um, title and acronym, which is the um, Climate Solutions Fund, so the CSF. So we've gone from the CFI to the ERF to the CSF. Um, and that scheme has put up a further funding or pot of funding money, um, which is 200 um, million over the next 10 or so years. Um, so that's essentially um, how the CFI has kind of taken its journey. In terms of understanding the opportunity that the CFI presents, um, there's a couple of key steps that um, farmers um, or, or those um, who have land holdings can look to take to register a project. And the kind of administrative steps are essentially that um, you become the, um, the, the entity that is going to undertake the project. You can, if you want to outsource that um, 
responsibility to someone else to undertake the project on your behalf, but um, you um, are then able to look at what project you want to do, get your project registered, you then have to monitor or you implement your project, whether that's tree planting or whatever it might be, you then monitor um, the outcome from that project and that monitoring feeds into an offsets report, which then essentially um, identifies either how much um, emissions reduction you've achieved from your project activity or how much carbon you have sequestered. Um, and that can be in vegetation or in the soils. And so when we think about the land sector, the majority of the activity in that sector is very much related to carbon sequestration, um, although there are some emission reduction opportunities as well. And so once you've done your report, that will then determine how many credits you're going to receive. The scheme itself is regulated by um, the Clean Energy Regulator, and there is the opportunity for you to essentially go in and participate in um, bidding your project into auctions that the regulator holds on a relatively frequent basis um, in order to secure a contract with the government and then essentially deliver your um, credits to the government under that contract and receive a, a, a revenue and income stream. Um, the maximum length of time that you can get a contract for, um, for carbon sequestration projects is 10 years. So you're essentially getting an agreement with the government that they're going to buy the credits off you for a 10 year period. Um, and um, that kind of backs in, I guess, your ability to know that you're going to generate revenue from your project. The crediting period itself is actually um, longer than that 10 year contract period. So for um, sequestration projects, you're actually able to generate your carbon credits for up to 25 years. Now, what I wanted to do is just, um, I think sometimes I find pictures or um, graphs, etc., the best way to um, show you some of the stats um, of the scheme so far. So what I wanted to do was just finish off um, with um, a couple of slides just to give you an indica indication of how the scheme has performed to date. So the, the absolute main thing in terms of being able to do a project, a carbon project, is that there needs to be a set of rules for your project activity. So what has happened over the last um, nine or so years that the scheme's been operating is that the um, government has devised these sets of rules, which are called methods. And so there's two primary sets of rules that are applicable for the land-based sector. So one is vegetation me methods. Um, so for example, tree planting, um, not cutting down trees, so avoided deforestation. And the most popular method we've seen so far is what's called human-induced regeneration. That is a method where essentially you make a decision to um, allow land to naturally regenerate. So you might have cleared it previously, you might have had stock on it, you might have feral goats, um, you might have be using it for pasture. You essentially decide to stop that activity and you allow that area to come back and to naturally regenerate and then you get to count the sequestration that um, comes out of that um, regeneration. And then there's a whole set of agricultural methods um, for different sectors. And this is where our soil carbon um, methods come in. And this is where you, again, you introduce a different activity into your farming practices to essentially increase the soil carbon, which you measure, you know, you get your baseline and then you're able to measure it after you've been doing those activities for a number of years to see the increase in that soil carbon. And we've had quite a number of projects that have been registered under that particular method. This is a snapshot of our project activity over the last two years. And really this just shows you um, the significance of the vegetation and the agricultural methods to the um, scheme itself. So you'll see that the majority of projects that are taking place in the scheme are vegetation. And very much, as I said, what we've seen over the last couple of years is a huge take up of the human induced regeneration method. And where has that take up been? This is probably a bit of a busy slide, but um, it essentially shows you that we've had a huge project activity happening in New South Wales around the Cobar Burke region. That has all been primarily um, 
to do with avoided deforestation. So farmers agreeing not to clear their land when they've got um, approvals to do so, but also increasingly human induced regeneration. And then the other significant project activity has been in Queensland. Um, we're increasingly now seeing the HIR projects being taken up in Western Australia as well. But you'll see, for example, in Victoria that there haven't been that many vegetation projects and indeed the main project activity is from the agricultural sector. Um, this is really um, designed to give you on a page a snapshot of the ERF, the um, Emissions Reduction Fund to date. As I say, the government holds on a re relatively regular basis these auctions and allows projects to come in and bid at those auctions. So it's the lowest bid, um, it's a reverse price auction. So the lowest bids are the ones that are successful. What it shows you is that the majority of projects that have been the subject of contracts with the government come out of the vegetation sector. So 136 million out of our about 200 million, 200 million tonnes that has been committed um, to be sold to the government so far. And then you'll also see the price point. So the average price at auction has varied since the auctions kicked off back in um, 2015. Um, and we've gone from kind of just under $14 to just under $16 at the last auction in September with an average price now of around $12. And then finally, I just wanted to show you where the economic value was, which is probably not surprising um, given what I said about where the majority of the projects are, but this gives you an understanding of the um, income that's been generated for the regions that have really taken on board the opportunity that the um, Carbon Farming Initiative or the Emissions Reduction Fund has presented and um, really where those economic benefits have flowed through the project activity and through the credits that have been issued and then sold to the government. So I'm conscious, Jen, of not going over time. I think that the last point I'll just finish with is um, really to say that I think what the ERF has demonstrated is that there is this huge opportunity that can be um, stimulated by the use of um, if I can put it crudely, money, you know, of the ability to commoditise carbon um, and to produce a revenue off the back of carbon. I think there are a couple of key things that we've still got to tackle um, to really get this sector happening. And Stephen mentioned one, which is aggregation, how you get, you know, the scale happening. Um, and that's particularly relevant if we want to get big investment coming into this sector. Um, but we also need to expand our the types of projects that can be undertaken on the land. And this is an issue, an initiative that's underway at the moment with the clean energy regulators to really how we can get more project um, opportunities happening. And in particular, one big focus area is um, looking at landscape. So not just at a tree planting or at a soil carbon project, but how we wrap it all up, very much, I guess, aligned with that whole regenerative agriculture model to, to count it all and to ideally count the biodiversity and all of the other co-benefits as well that flow from doing these carbon projects. So I will stop there, but happy to take questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, one exciting development was how soil carbon became one of the priorities on the technology roadmap for the federal government. And what they're looking at is um, streamlining the testing because um, that appears to be the barrier. Do you think um, that's a real opportunity for the farming sector, particularly if that can be streamlined? I think it is. I think it also very much linked to links to that kind of idea of scale and of getting cost efficiencies. So obviously if you're doing it at a small project level, then the costs are greater than if you can do it over a much larger um, land mass area. And so it's how you can perhaps get some synergies where you're bringing together lots of small land holdings to do something which looks at it um, from a broader perspective. And I think um, technology will have a huge role to play in terms of how we can um, use technology to perhaps, you know, do some of that measurement um, exercise. I should have also mentioned that another um, recent change that's been made is that there, there is now the ability to get $5,000 up front um, from the regulator to do a soil carbon project, which really is intended to cover those initial costs of establishing your baseline. Because obviously, as you will appreciate with um, many of these 
projects and particularly with the sequestration projects, you don't actually start earning your revenue until your project has been up and running for some time. So you've incurred quite a lot of costs up front before you actually start generating a return back front. And so there, I think there's a recognition of, of the impediment that that presents at the moment for soil carbon projects. Yeah, a lot of the farmers are saying that it doesn't go far enough, Alyssa, because it's more of a debt. So it's not like it's a grant. Um, and with the paperwork that's involved, it's not worth going through the process. Um, do you see that, that there's been a lot of take up of it in, um, from your observation in the sector? What we do know is that certainly in the lead up to the last auction in September, um, there were quite a few soil carbon projects registered. So I think there is generally a lot of um, interest in the area, but I take your point that um, the 5,000 probably, you know, isn't really sufficient um, and it is something that ultimately gets deducted, you know, once your project starts um, earning revenue. So um, I think the... The scope is huge and I think the government has recognised that by identifying this as one of the five key technologies that they want to pursue under their technology roadmap. I think the, the opportunity is amazing because it's not just the carbon benefit, there's you know a lot of other benefits, the main one being productivity as well, productivity increases. So and I think Australia is you know amazingly well positioned um, given where we currently are at the moment. So we're the first country you know in the world to have formally had credits issued off the back of a soil carbon project. So we're kind of world bleeding in that respect. And I do think there's an amazing opportunity for Australia mm. in that space. And I agree. And that's consistent with what Stephen was saying in terms of the capability in Australia around the regenerative agricultural space and also in the carbon sector. Um, what I'd like to do is, is open up to Q&A and I'd like to ask um, Tony the next question because it's related to Alyssa's discussion. What do you think about the value add on soil carbon, Tony? Um, what are your thoughts? Is it a tool to help incentivise farmers? I think people have been uh, quite excited about the potential of, uh, of carbon farming uh, over probably a decade or more now. Uh, and uh, for most of those people that I've talked to who are interested in that, they've been very disappointed about the delivery of it. Uh, they haven't found it practical to get involved. And um, my assessment at the moment is that the barriers to small farmer participation in the carbon farming arrangement are still too high. Um, uh, we had a discussion with the minister about that at the end of last year. Uh, and maybe that's informed some of the changes that have happened. But, but again, I don't think they've gone far enough to, to get people over the line. The other thing that concerns me about soil carbon, I mean, carbon is a hugely important topic. Um, I'm not in any way uh, dismissing that. Um, but the thing that concerns me is that a singular focus on carbon um, without thinking about some of the other elements uh, really misses the point. And in order to have effective carbon cycling in our, in, our, um, in our environment, you need to also think about the biodiversity aspects. And, um, uh, you know, Alyssa, thank you very much for your explanation. It's very clear of how the carbon markets work. Um, but I always pick a bone of contention for people who call, talk about biodiversity as a co-benefit. In fact, I think it works the other way around. You know, biodiversity is the central benefit and the carbon side of it is the co-benefit in my, in my way of thinking about it. So, you know, um, that's why we're very strongly focused on measuring the health of the biodiversity and then achieving the carbon as a secondary element of that. Still on mute, um, Jennifer. Sorry, Peter Andrews, are you still on the line there? Um, I just got a um, note from St Stephen from the chat room saying that he wants to restore Geraton for you. Tell me, how do we make that happen? Um, you know, if you were given $50 million, what would you do with that money to restore that part of the region? And you're on mute still, Peter. Uh, the Western Australian yelled, you mean? Is yes. It, what what could you do? Because um, there's all oh, the many it's, issues, and it's, it's not a problem because the plants were able to build 
the structure of the landscape. And for a very long time, this landscape was functioning at an unbelievably effective way. And the skeleton is still there, damaged, of course. But it isn't that difficult. We went to the Geraldton property and in a few weeks, well, a week and a half, I think it was, went from 50 mil of rain running off in a day, they were never running any off at all. That was one property we started on. But that can be done in lots of places. But then we must learn to reorganise the plants so that we recycle that water and we don't lose it. And that's what this old landscape gives us a blueprint of how to go about that. Absolutely. And we're very fortunate. We just have to pay attention to it, I think. Um, sure Stephen, um, what are your, your thoughts and how do we scale up some of these, these efforts? Yeah, I think the, the reality is it, it's a, it is actually thinking at that scale that's critical to the art mission. And it was, in fact, Geraldton that I was invited to two years ago where I met with the um, local community government business leaders and everything else. And that was when I did that tour of, of WA, pretty much from Geraldton North up to Exmouth. And, um, and that was the very landscape that I looked at thinking, there's got to be something here that can be done. So I was just staggered when Peter mentioned that specifically. Um, yeah, it, it is precisely the, the kind of location where we would love to work at scale, where I do believe we would have um, you know, regional government support and landowner support. And, and with, with Peter's knowledge, um, it is precisely the kind of program we'd love to embark on within the ARC 2030 mission. So we must sort of hook up on that. Second thing I just wanted to throw in following the discussion about the carbon credits, that lock that um, was mentioned about, you have to invest up front in order for you then to have to wait for the carbon credits to be effectively verified and sold into the market is absolutely the crippling mechanism that, is, that is, has actually hindered the carbon credit market since they were first developed. And that was one of the very issues I was trying to resolve when we created the um, carbon credit backed arc point system, the reward and loyalty system. And that in essence, means that we've created some liquidity into that market space because companies who are wanting to, to do their offsets can effectively acquire carbon credit futures from programs supported by ARC funding. So in effect, farmers can, can access the, the likely future carbon credit production in advance of the carbon credits being um, certified and validated. <clears throat> it's a treasury function, it's a complex function, but I think it, it is absolutely imperative that you know, corporate Australia backs this idea of supporting carbon credit futures because it's only by unlocking future carbon credit revenues that you actually encourage farmers to, uh, uh, to, to actually make that initial investment. So they don't have to wait four or five years to start making money from the carbon credits that they will produce in the future. Um, so I think really, really important. And that will be one of our key communication messages through uh, 2021 is, 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 is actually plugging that gap in the carbon credit futures market. Some of the biggest exchanges in the world are actually looking at that now as part of the, the mechanism. I know Vera, we're talking to Vera about that too. Um, it's absolutely critical. You cannot have a system where you have to invest all the time, energy and money up front and then wait four or five years to actually start receiving money for that investment. And unlocking that is absolutely part of the, the ARC mechanism to, to provide liquidity into that market space. Jennifer, um, I don't know whether it's possible, mm -hmm. but could I make a contribution on the carbon market side of things? Absolutely, go ahead. Uh, the other factor that hasn't been mentioned is that built into the current arrangements uh, for the carbon credits implemented by the Australian government is an additionality clause. And so in a sense, this is a distortion, you know, it's, it's called a carbon market, but in fact, it's a carbon granting program 
under a various range of rules. It's not a, you know, the trading elements have been removed from it. So it's, it's not really a market mechanism. And so under these additionality rules, you have to move forward or increase your carbon from where you are living right now. And that really rules out people who've already made some significant achievements and a contribution. So um, the underlying science behind the carbon policy in Australia is, is deficient to that extent that it rules out people who are already doing a great job and it rewards people who, who you know, maybe have been not doing so well. It's a very strange system. I'll um, ask Alyssa to comment on that because that does relate to the way um, carbon is, is measured. Over to you, Alyssa. Alyssa. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so probably in my introduction, I should have um, covered the topic of additionality, but the, the whole idea behind allowing um, revenue to be generated from projects which reduce emissions or sequester carbon is that you are doing something other than business as usual. So it's intended to incentivise new activity and not to reward for you continuing to do your existing activity. So that's why we have this concept of additionality and there's different ways that you can test it. In Australia, a decision was taken that um, it was going to be a pretty, I guess, potentially blunt instrument, which is you can only come into the scheme if you are a new project. So you can't, if you've already unfortunately started your project activity, you therefore, you know, are excluded from registering under the scheme. Um, that was, as I say, it was relatively blunt, blunt instrument, but that was the decision that was taken in terms of the way our scheme was got, going to operate. There are other kinds of additionality tests that can be used, such as, you know, financial um, additionality is the revenue needed in order to um, make these projects happen. Um, are the projects needed because, you um, uh, there is a regulation. That's another reason why projects sometimes are prevented from coming in. But at the end of the day, if we want carbon markets to work, they have to retain their integrity. And I, I'm a very strong believer of that at its heart. I do consider that our Australian scheme has put environmental integrity at the heart and soul of it. And I consider that the scheme is very well regarded and very well placed ultimately to provide um, an opportunity to e export our credits to, to other parts of the world. But you have to have a scheme that, that has integrity at heart because otherwise if we start getting integrity issues, it's just going to undermine the whole point of using, of doing these projects and generating credits particularly sequestration credits um, to, to address climate change and to, to offset, you know, emissions. So, yes, additionally, you know, it can be a blunt tool, but it's, it's there for a reason. And, and one way to look at it, I can understand um, um, how it's challenging for those that have done the right thing and they're not being rewarded. But um, Robert Quirk, he's a cane grower and he's um, achieved 8% soil carbon, which is quite incredi incredible in the cane sector. But what he did say to me was, well, over all these years, I've been so much more productive and profitable. And that's been so much more significant than what the carbon credits would have given to me anyway. So it is, it is, it is, it, it is a disappointment for those who have been the leaders but they've got the advantage anyway by not waiting. So that's another way um, of, of looking at it. Um, now, um, um, Stephen, any, I'll give everyone a chance to just make some final comments, I suppose, and, uh, and um, to focus the comment on, you know, what should we be striving for in the next 12 months? We need to give some input to, to Better Futures Australia on what should our inspiration be? What should be our vision? that we, we take to the next COP. Um, over to you, Stephen, you're really good on the vision side. So I'll um, get you to speak first. You're still on mute, pe mute, mute Stephen. Yeah, I think the final point I would like to make is that when we launched Restore Australia back in February last year, at the height of the fires, uh, Australia was on front front page news around the world, and we had global appetite to to help. And the AstraZeneca project, um, in, launched in September, was indicative of that. But the world has got short memories, and COVID has stepped in. So Australia has actually dropped off the agenda as far as the rest of the world is concerned. 
Uh, and for me, that's quite critical. What it means is Australia as a government, as corporates, businesses, uh, and the people of Australia have effectively got to get got to get together and unite behind restoring these great ecosystems of Australia. Uh, it, it ultimately comes down to every country has got to help itself. And Australia's got a huge opportunity, as everybody has said today, to lead the way globally, which in the in the context of your political environment, I find absolutely fascinating. It's a little bit like what goes on in America with Trump. You know, it's sort of you've got a, the leadership perhaps saying one thing, but the rest of the country saying that's not us. That's not what we represent. So we need corporate Australia and financial Australia to essentially get behind this. The whole point of ARC is to provide a single, singular unifying mission within which there are lots of teams all doing their thing. So our, our view and belief is that if we can make sure everybody in Australia understands the role and the importance of leading the way internationally, um, I think there's a really bright and optimistic future. But we need Australia to engage, not just sit and look from the sides and it not be a, a marginal issue with lots of passionate people. It needs to be a mainstream issue with every business engaged and every citizen of Australia engaged to do some amazing work that the, the, the unique environment and size and scale of Australia provides an, a fantastic opportunity to make a global contribution to reversing the climate crisis. And, and it's time for everybody to get together and make that happen. But it's got to be concerted, unified mission, not lots and lots of fragmented little efforts on the side. Beautiful. Um, what an opportunity for Australia, but an absolute disaster if we don't do something, Stephen, as well, because of the extreme weather events with the fires, they're just going to get worse and worse. Um, and economically, we can't afford it as much as anything. So um, next, um, Peter Dowson, your thoughts. Thanks. Um, I'm not sure if Stephen Fern remembers, uh, there was an Olympic moment that Australians really love and we call it the Stephen Bradbury moment. And uh, I'll share the clip actually for later uh, entertainment, but it's when the Australian ice skater who was so far off the back of the pack and then everyone else just tumbles and he wins the gold, takes the gold. and. Um, we were in uh, Luxembourg for the Global Landscapes Forum and spoke to Jackie Johnson from uh, Sustainable Finance Initiative um, and she said that's what, what you're saying is what she was saying, Australia can have a, a Stephen Bradbury moment and I think the fact that COP26 has been delayed by a year gives us that extra breathing space to, to get some really great things going and my vision is that in 12 months time we'll be there in Glasgow telling some really good stories about how we've got these initiatives up and going. And I, would, I want to see um, jaws on the ground from what's possible in Australia because you spotted it, Stephen. Australia is one massive continent sized opportunity and the Australian landscape managers can lead the way forward uh, at COP26. That's what Peter Andrews has said to us from day one since we showed up. And I think that's totally possible. So yeah. And Peter, I'd love, I would love your help in telling that story into Australia as soon as possible, because I think this is, mm -hmm. as I just said, for the rest of the world, it's just dropped off the agenda and it just shows how short everybody's memories are. So I really think this has got to come out of Australia and, and it's sort of driven from within. And telling that story to, to say to Australia, you can have that moment on the world stage and, and we're ready to go, we're already started. So we can buy, buy cop, you know, this can be absolutely delivered, but we need corporate Australia to hear this fast, not in a year's time. You got it. Yeah, you, and, and Pete, you do such a beautiful job in telling the story. We love your work. And what you show that Peter can achieve with his methods is incredible and it can hydrate Australia. Um, I just find it crazy that we're not doing it when you can see the work he does and it works. Um, it, I think it's just crazy. And leading on to that, um, to Tony, because he can see the work that can be achieved with what he's doing. I've seen great outcomes um, with, with um, rotational grazing and the other ecological outcomes that Tony focuses on. Um, Tony, would you like to give us your thoughts and your conclusions? I, I think you're right. I think, um, you know, there's been great work done 
uh, by campaigners over the years who've, you know, defended environmental values, defended areas of forest, defended uh, and campaigned for all sorts of things in the Great Barrier Reef. And that's raised a huge awareness amongst the population. But I think people are now waiting for their role, their chance to play a key role in where we go from here. And um, with the market mechanism, so, so we have to move on uh, our activities from the situation where we were campaigning and relying on donations and voluntary input and philanthropists into a situation where this becomes a key market mechanism, a true market mechanism, uh, where people get the information about the environment that they need to make those crucial decisions. And if we can do that, we can get the businesses and the consumers engaged with this campaign, and it can work at a very fast pace. We're already seeing that. And um, just as one small example, our first farm to get ecological outcome verification was the Maloon Creek Natural Farms uh, uh, doing their, their free range eggs and uh, available for sale through Harris Farm Markets. Uh, those egg boxes will now have the ecological verification seal on them. And so that'll be directly sending consumers the, uh, the signal that they need uh, that they can choose to buy those eggs and support ecological health. That's just one example and there's many more to come. Do you think um, people will pay the premium for um, food that's regenerative, Tony? Uh, the market needs to work that out. Uh, we're not designing a premium into our, into our arrangements. Um, we want to build the relationship, build the profile. Uh, but yes, uh, you know, if people can understand the difference between uh, food that's produced off ecologically healthy land uh, and other land, uh, I've heard people talk about this in the way that the nutrient density of that food increases. And so if you start to pay your money, uh, not based on the, the kilos of product, but on terms of the, the amount of nutrients that you're actually buying in the food, so many people can easily tell the difference. Mm. For instance, just in the quality of an egg that's produced in this way versus an egg that's produced in the industrial um, way. And uh, I had that example when I was uh, cooking my eggs at a, at, a, at a fire service breakfast on a hot plate. And, uh, and I broke my eggs and they were sitting up nice and proud and doing a great thing. And a guy came in and broke some eggs on the plate and they pretty much instantly turned into an omelette. And he said, what's the difference between my eggs and yours? And I said, well, mine came from the chooks yesterday that are in my back. <coughs> Oh, it's incredible how different they are. And the taste, Tony, the taste is so different as well, isn't it? So it's not just a nutritional the value. the nutrient value of the eggs as well, absolutely. Yeah. And if anyone and wants to know more about the um, health benefits um, of regenerative food, Gundi, in the first session, did a really good presentation on all the health issues that come from eating food that's not regenerative. And, um, and it's something worth watching because I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if, if it's widely well known about in terms of the health issues that um, the current food system actually can create. Stephen, you were going to say something? I was just about to say, J.W. Thompson did the, did a, the world's largest survey into consumer res, um, response to this very issue. And nearly nine, the, the response to nearly every question was 90% plus consumers will switch brand and pay more for to work with brands that show they care about the planet. And that includes where our food, of course, comes from. And there was a very real example. There were thousands of very real examples being co coordinated by a group out of America that we're involved with, which are driven by real businesses showing real results where consumers are willing to pay a premium, not a huge premium, but at least a premium where, where they know where their food is coming from and that, that it's produced in this way. Uh, and I think COVID helps that, absolutely. It's that resetting we're talking about. So I do believe that will be will, will come into the economic models. I think it's really important that it builds into the economic model and its value throughout the food chain. This is not about the, the food manufacturers making extra margin from this it's about the farmers making extra margin from that and the consumers can begin to vote in a way that 
years ago they were never able to because of data because of information because of knowledge the consumers can drive this agenda in a way that was never previously possible and some of the best apps in the world now are helping this kogo out of out of new zealand brilliant example you can literally put into that you know whether you want your food to come from places which pay living wage not minimum wage you know all the different criteria about how this works in terms of what your consumer preferences are and it will tell you then where to go and buy that that's going to be a the movement of the of the 2020s Absolutely. consumer Absolutely. power will will drive this agenda and it'll make sure that money gets down to the farmers because if it doesn't the consumers will walk away um, very powerful. Talking of walking away, I have to go now, I'm afraid. So thank you very much for your time, everybody. That, that's okay. And, We're just uh, going to um, thank you, Stephen, so much. And Alyssa, just a quick um, final note from you before we close. Yes, well, as um, the viewers will realise, I'm a huge advocate of markets. So um, I do believe that carbon markets have got a huge role to play in terms of where we need to get to. I just thought I'd reference a recent um, consultation document that's come out. So there is a task force that's been set up on scaling voluntary carbon markets um, and that says that we need to see an increase a 15-fold increase in where we're currently at in terms of carbon market um, generation and carbon credit generation if we've to got um, got any hope of achieving our Paris agreement targets so the opportunity is huge it's absolutely clear that natural capital solutions or natural climate solutions are going to play a huge role in in um, providing that voluntary carbon opportunity and so you know I think Australia is amazingly well positioned and, and we should be ready to take that opportunity. Thank you and what we have um, been able to see today is the solutions are there. What we've got so much wisdom and we just need to listen to those people that have the wisdom and we need to help those people with the wis wisdom to scale these projects up. Um, and that's gonna be fundamental and the financing is gonna be fundamental, which is why I did invite Stephen along because I think, you know, every one of you, and you, you're just some examples, but, but I must admit, we do have a very brilliant panel here um, that are demonstrating what is possible. And you are the people that really excite me about the potential and give me hope um, for the future. Um, we do have a um, survey that um, will be going out to those that are um, watching. If you could put your input, um, it would be very much appreciated. We're wanting to get as much input into looking at how we can actually um, structure, the, structure our uh, aspirations and our vision and how can we get there and how can we support these movements and how we can do that through collaborating. And collaborating is going to be sort of the focus of the next session, which is on Thursday. Um, we've got some amazing speakers as well on Thursday. Um, the CEO from Farmers for Action, um, the Greening Australia, NRM Australia, Soils for Life. Um, we, we got a great um, lineup. So um, that will be our final session. I would like to thank all the speakers enormously, not just for your contribution today. But all of you have dedicated your life to wanting to make a difference. And, um, and that's, you know, I have the utmost respect for all the speakers that are, that are, that are here. And I was very um, lucky to get involved in Peter Andrews' 80th celebration, a birthday celebration. He's made it to 80. We want him to make it longer. But what we want to make sure is he is a genius and we do not want a genius to leave this world with us actually showing what can happen with work that he can do. We need to get behind him. And, you know, I've got a personal commitment where I really want to see his work happen because it is so important. But, you know, we just got to collaborate and we, we just, we just got, to, got to make it happen because it's all possible. And it's frustrating when you can see it, but it's, it's not happening as quickly as it should. I'd like to thank Lisa from Better Futures Australia and Mel and thank, thank Mel with, we did have a few issues with connectivity today, but thanks for managing through that. And I, I thank everyone for their time and I welcome you to the next session on Thursday. Would love you to come along, sign up to Better Futures Australia if you wanna have a voice. Um, love to have you on board. We need everyone's contribution. We need all the ideas. 
we need to have the best possible plan and vision. Because remember what Stephen said, Australia has to lead this. We've got the capability here. We've got the knowledge, we've got the expertise, we've got the carbon markets. We got to go to Glasgow and we got to show what everyone else can do. We got to lead it. It's up to us. Thank you, everyone.